Hi, my name is Debbie Waldman, and I'm going to read to you from my book, A Sackful of Feathers, which was illustrated by Cindy Ravel and published by Orca Book Publishers in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. The story is based on a Jewish folktale about gossip, or basically the dangers of gossip. You might think of it as fake news in the shtetl. In the village of Old Kinnick lived a boy named Yonkel who loved to tell stories. Not his own stories, mind you. Yonkel found other people's stories far more interesting. And because his father owned the village store, and the store was where everyone gathered to trade news, Yonkel was able to overhear many stories which he took great pride in repeating. Oi, can you believe what I did? Rev Wolf was laughing so loudly he could barely get the words out of his mouth. What? What did you do this time? The men pressed closer to the baker, eager for more. I lost my glasses again! Reb Wolf paused and let out such a thunderous whoop that Yonkel dropped his broom. And so I put salt in the rigoluch, not sugar, salt, like stones those rigoluch would have tasted. The men erupted into laughter. That's nothing, one called out. My wife's rigoluch tastes like candle wax. And another piped up, my wife's tastes like old shoes. Yonkel slipped out the door to tell his friends the latest news. So he never heard the end of the story, where Rev Wolf told the men how his wife discovered the mistake and made him throw away the dough. Even the chickens wouldn't eat it, he said. At the schoolyard, Yonkel was so busy telling his latest story that he didn't see the rabbi standing nearby. That crazy Reb Wolf, Yonkel said. He put salt in the rugeluch, not sugar, salt. Imagine that. Those rugeluch tasted like stones. Yuck, Yonkel's friends said to each other. I'll never eat anything from Reb Wolf's bakery again. Returning to the store that afternoon, Yonkel hurried past the bakery. He did not notice the customers crowded inside or the rabbi standing by the door, biting into rugeluch so sweet and tender. It all but melted in his mouth. Back at the store, Yonkel was dusting the shelves when he heard a commotion by the fabrics. Turning, he watched, fascinated, as Freya Selinsky tried to grab a bolt of fabric from Rivka Meisel's hands. He was out of the store so quickly that he was long gone by the time Rivka and Freya agreed that perhaps they could share the cloth. They apologized to each other, and together they carried the fabric to the front of the store. Meanwhile, at the schoolyard, Yonkel's friends gathered around him. Freya Selinsky lives next to me, Yossi Bergman said. She yelled at my dog once for barking. She's mean. That's what I'm saying, Yonkel said. You've never seen anything like it. They were fighting like cats. He waved his hands wildly and made loud shrieking noises. The boys joined in. Soon, their commotion could be heard clear across the schoolyard which is where the rabbi happened to be taking his afternoon stroll. When Yonkel returned to the store, his father greeted him. Yankala, where have you been? He asked, handing him a dust rag. I found this on the counter by the fabrics. Yonkel took the dust rag and he wandered to the other side of the store. There, beautiful Tova Fleischer, the butcher's daughter, lovingly fingered a lace tablecloth. Up behind her came Levi Weinberg, the cobbler's son. Levi slipped his arms around Tova. She looked over her shoulder and laughed. Levi lifted the tablecloth out of her hands and he draped it over her head, so she looked like a bride. As he stood smiling, she walked around him the way a bride would circle her groom at her wedding. Then Levi pulled Tova to him and gave her a kiss, and she kissed him back. Yonkel could not believe his eyes. Wasn't Tova supposed to marry the rabbi's nephew? Hadn't he heard that last week in the store? Of course he had, and he had told all of his friends. Dropping his rag, Yonkel hurried toward the door. He'd almost reached the schoolyard when he felt a hand on his shoulder. Finish with your dusting, Yonkel? the rabbi asked. Yes, sir, he said. The rabbi looked at him sternly. No, sir, Yonkel said, looking down at his feet. Where were you going in such a hurry then? Yonkel swallowed. The rabbi waited. I saw Levi Weinberg kissing Tova Fleischer, Yonkel said finally. I wanted to tell my friends. Just as last week you told them that Tova was marrying my nephew, the rabbi said. Yonkel was confused. How did the rabbi know what he was telling his friends? Stories spread, Yonkel, the rabbi said. 
you tell your friends, your friends talk to each other, people over here, and the story goes where it goes. My nephew is marrying a lovely girl from another village. How do you think his bride would feel if she heard that he was marrying Tova? The rabbi didn't wait for an answer. They had arrived at his house, and he was reaching for a brown sack from a corner near the door. I have a job for you, he said, presenting the sack to Yankel. Yankel peered inside. This sack is full of feathers, he said. Indeed it is, the rabbi agreed, and I want you to put one on every doorstep in the village. On every doorstep a feather? But why? You will understand soon enough. It was late in the afternoon. As Yanko laid a feather on the doorstep of his father's store, he watched the men gathered by the window. He tried to make out what they were saying, but a breeze stirred the feathers in the sack, and he was reminded of his task. The next stop was Freya Selinsky's house. He hurried through the front gate and dropped the feather, not even bothering to see where it landed. He did the same thing at the houses of Levi Weinberg, Mendel the Butcher, and Reb Wolf. When he came to Rifka Meisel's house, he saw her through the window, her back to him, and he sat down a feather and ran. On his way back to the rabbi's house, Yanko wondered what story he would tell his schoolmates tomorrow. If only he could stop at the store. He was so wrapped up in his thoughts that he barely felt the gust of wind that sent a cloud of feathers swirling behind him up toward the sky. The rabbi was waiting for Yanko. That's a good boy, he said when Yanko held out the empty sack. Now I want you to get all the feathers, put them back into the sack, and bring them back here to me. Excuse me, Rabbi? Go and get all the feathers and bring them back. Hurry, Yanko, for soon it will be dark, and the feathers will be hard to find. Bring back all the feathers? Yanko asked. Go, the Rabbi said, nudging him out the door. Yanko felt as if someone had tied his stomach in knots. How would he ever find all the feathers before dark? And even if he did, how would he then have time to find a story to tell his friends tomorrow? Yanko Leibovich, what are you doing? Yanko looked up from Freya Silinsky's hedge to see her staring down at him, large and imposing. I'm looking for a feather, he explained. Are you crazy? she asked. For what do you need a feather? Your mother has feathers in the pillows at your house. I have feathers on the chickens in my coop. You want a feather? I'll give you a feather. No, no, Yanko said. Not any feather. A feather I left here earlier today. Any feather you left here today blew away a long time ago, Yanko Leibovich. Why would you leave a feather on my doorstep anyway? The rabbi told me to, Yanko said. Are you telling me a story, Yanko? No, no, Yanko stammered. I am telling the truth. But if your feather is gone, then I must go too, for I have many feathers to find before the sun sets. And off he went, down the road to the Weinberg house. Yanko Leibovich, what are you doing? Levi Weinberg's voice so surprised Yanko that he slipped off the rock he'd been standing on and landed in a cold, dirty puddle. I'm looking for a feather I left here earlier today, Yanko replied, trying to shake the water from his coat and trousers. I never saw a feather, Levi said. If you wanted me to have a feather, why didn't you knock on the door and hand it to me? The rabbi told me to leave it on your doorstep, Yankel explained. Why on my doorstep? What's this about a feather? Not just your doorstep, everyone's doorstep. I don't know why, but the rabbi said to do it, so I must. And if your feather is gone, then I must go too, for I have many feathers to find before the sun sets. The home of Mendel the Butcher, Tova's father. Yankel tripped on a loose cobblestone and tore his trousers. He didn't find a feather. At the home of Reb Wolf, he had to fight off hungry cats who thought he was after their food. He didn't find a feather. At the home of Rifka Meisel, he thought he found a feather. But when he got closer, he saw that it was a dead bird, killed, no doubt, by Reb Wolf's cats. By the time Yankel returned to the rabbi's house, the sun had set. A full moon lit the sky. The silvery stars looked almost like the feathers he'd lost that afternoon. He was tired, hungry, wet, and scratched, and very, very unhappy. The rabbi, on the other hand, was pleased to see him. Yankala, you have returned!
turn. Show me what you have. Yonko turned the sack upside down and shook it. Nothing came out. He turned it inside out just to be certain. I found no feathers, Rabbi, he said. I looked and looked. He pointed to the tear in his trousers and the mud stains on his coat in case the rabbi doubted his effort. They're gone. I can't get them back. And so it is with the stories you spread, Yankala, the rabbi said, motioning Yankal to the table, where a bowl of steaming soup, a thick slice of bread, and a plate of rugelach awaited him. Once you tell a story, you cannot take it back. It goes where it goes, and you cannot say where, or how, or when. Think of that the next time you tell a story, Yankal, and make sure the next story you tell is your own. Yankal finished his bread and soup. Then he ate all the rugelach, which seemed unusually tender and sweet. He thanked the rabbi for the lesson, and he went out to the road. And as he made his way back home, he knew just what story he would tell his schoolmates the next day. The story of a boy who went looking for feathers that had long been blown away by the wind. Thanks for watching. Watching? Yeah, watching. Thanks for watching. Also for washing your hands at this time. <laughs>